let's have ourselves a chat about why you should be training with weapons if you do Kung Fu. Uh, now, Chinese martial arts is known for having a very broad arsenal compared to other traditional martial arts systems. Uh, even within one style of Kung Fu, you have often uh, at least a half dozen to a dozen weapons. And then you have the, the variety of Chinese martial arts systems and their specialties. They have specialty versions of the weapons or even weapons that exist only in a few systems. Uh, and again, it's, it's very important. You could argue it's part of the culture that you're practicing, the traditions you're practicing. Uh, but there's another reason and, and for practical terms, a much more important reason why you should be putting your time into learning your weapon sets. Now, I personally was not a fan of training with weapons back in the day. I didn't like doing it. I felt it was archaic. Uh, I thought like you're not gonna get in a fight with the sword next Tuesday, so you're training time was better spent focusing on just the empty hand and getting better with defending yourself with your hands and your feet. Uh, I was wrong. So I did train weapon sets. I did you know, go to tournaments and do weapons forms and come back with medals. I did do demonstrations for our school with weapons, but it didn't resonate with me. I felt it's like something Steve wanted me to do, so I did it. Years later, really it clicked with me and I realized why. Like my Sifu left it to me to, you know, pen to my own knitting to figure it out. And I did, and it took me a while, but then it clicked. The weapon sets that we train develop both physical attributes, habits, and skills that apply directly to your empty hand self-defense. So again, you're not getting to fight with a weapon next Tuesday. Uh, you're going to use the principles from that weapon with your bare hands though if you do get into an altercation. Uh, now we'll circle back to a point here in a second but for me the epiphany came with dumbbell which is the actually weapon I'm best with it's my favorite. Uh, for years I got away with doing dumbbell incorrectly so I would muscle it and do my techniques correctly enough and with really low stances and really nice kicks where I would do well at demonstrations, I would earn medals from tournaments, but I didn't get it. I didn't understand the weapon. I thought I did, but I did not. So the difference between doing this and actually using the weapon is the waist the waist moving the hands. The connection there makes the weapon dynamic. It makes the weapon actually do what it's supposed to do. And that directly applies to your empty hand techniques. Your waist connecting to your hands improves your ability to actually use your techniques effectively. Again, it took me a while to figure that out, much to my chagrin. Uh, now we circle back here an example of how this has been a long-term thing. This wasn't just 20th century, 21st century, we all decide, oh, let's keep trading weapons, it's still good for you. The Kwambao, formerly called the Spring and Autumn Blade. Uh, the weapon was renamed after General Guan Yu from the Warring States period. That weapon fell out of favor in the battlefield about a thousand years ago. It was gradually phased out and replaced by weapons like the Pu Dao, Trident, and other uh, glaives and pole arms, what have you. Uh, but the weapon was still taught in Chinese martial arts schools in those bigger and heavier and kind of clunky because of the secondary benefits of the training. So not the direct combat application, but what it did for you as far as physical attributes and skill development. So the Kwan Do being a heavy weapon, if you are just using brute force, you're gonna wear yourself out. And you probably start using brute force and get some uh, fitness benefit from that. But to get the weapon, you have to have the strength and the connection. So your body's gotta move in unison. Now we'll use the Pudao, because we're indoors and our landlord has a uh, no giant glaive rule in the building. So that's another conversation. So using this, using an edge weapon, again, the same principles generally apply. If I'm just coming in here and doing this, I'm not getting it. Now, if the weapon moves with me, if I come in here and I'm using the weapon as intended, 
my body is moving together. My feet, my hips, my core musculature, everything's moving together. So I'm developing those physical attributes and teaching those parts of my body to work together. That directly applies to striking, grappling, and then joint locks, all the parts of empty hand combat are directly benefited by that training. Uh, the dual weapons. So, as an example, we'll use the butterfly knives or eight slash swords. So here, from our forms, I am blocking and attacking. So the weapons are doing different things, but they're working in harmony. They're moving through space separately, but they are defending and attacking simultaneously. Everything's working together. That directly applies to your empty hand self-defense from Wing Chun standpoint. Pata, Tanda. I am blocking and striking simultaneously. Honga, Black Tiger steals a heart. Fulfillment of the Faded Crane, so Yun Sao, that piercing technique. My hands are doing different things, but they're moving together. They're moving together and working in harmony. And the dual weapons, double broadsword, eight slash swords, teaches that lesson very effectively. Um, the spear and straight sword, again, uh, precision. So you're using those weapons, they're very precise weapons for like attacking vital points that improves your hand-eye coordination, kinesthetic awareness, and moving into position, out of position, exactly. So again, your precision striking like Phoenix Eye or Leopard Fist are directly benefited by training with things like the Chinese straight sword or the spear. That all being said, a lot of the techniques can be directly applied to a self-defense situation, depending on what's at hand. So I don't expect you to have a six foot length of oak or ash to hand, so a traditional staff or waxwood in a self-defense situation. However, if you work someplace that has a broom, and I bet you do, you are now armed. Now it's not as long or as heavy as a standard like six foot staff. It's probably not going to last through the altercation in one piece. So you're probably gonna be in the market for a new broom. However, in that time frame, you can effectively deliver staff techniques. So for the module two, we learned the beginner staff set. I can be here and deliver force on target using a shorter, lighter piece of wood. Because again, modern day situations, I'm not expecting you to have like uh, the heavy oak staff with you know steel caps on the ends of it, like the monkey kin staff. You're not fighting someone wearing lamellar armor. You're dealing with somebody who's in a t-shirt. And you can use the techniques right out of the forms to strike. A little bit of alterations here and there. Uh, you can jab in. So I'm here outside of his reach. He can't punch me. I can be here with a broom handle and jab him in the gut pretty hard. I can be here and use spear techniques with some precision. Strike the solar plexus, strike the throat, or strike the eyes if the situation dictates as much. Uh, the broadsword, unfortunately, I don't have a baseball bat handy, probably should, but a lot of the broadsword slashing techniques, maybe not in like the stabbing, but a lot of the slashing techniques from Dandao, you can pull off with a metal baseball bat pretty effectively against an unarmored opponent. Also, the glaives, halberds, pole arms. If you get your hands on a shovel, Again, it's lighter and it's not as long, but with some slight modifications, this can be used effectively using techniques from uh, the Pudao, the Guandao, and uh, so forth. Now, the odd thing is, any decent shovel you get from a hardware store is going to probably be a little sturdier than most, say, Pudao's or Guandao's or what have you, you order off the internet for training and performance. Unless you're getting a very expensive combat steel weapon, those are often hand forged and like, I guess bespoke is the word to use for that. Unless you're getting a really fancy one, 
a standard issue shovel is probably gonna be tougher than the poo dial you ordered off of uh, the internet. Uh, and that's, you know, is what it is. So again, it's gonna be a little bit shorter, so you have to adjust the techniques. But again, if I'm in here using these techniques here from the form, right? I can use the edge of the shovel and cause an awful lot of damage. So again, this is an unarmored opponent. He's not wearing scale mail or boiled leather. He's probably in a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. I can crack a skull with the flat of this using those techniques effectively. So if I switch, I can jab in and go to a rear strike, strike across, strike the body, strike the head, and do a lot of the thrusting stabbing motions against somebody who's not wearing a helmet, not wearing a breastplate, not wearing pauldrons. I can cause an awful lot of damage with a shovel. So again, a little creativity, you can actually use the techniques directly in a real world situation for some of the weapons. Um, but again, the primary takeaway from these is the lessons it teaches your body. So again, the qualm bow, the glaives, body connection, the, the broadsword, the waist, straight sword, spear, precision, uh, dual weapons, the coordination, your hands moving together, uh, doing separate things but in harmony, uh, and flexible weapons like the rope dart, arguably build courage. Uh, but again, that's the takeaways. You should be putting some time into weapons training. So, thank you, Bob. Thank you for coming to my rant.